Thank you very much for your kind introduction. I'm very pleased to be here today with all of you. Do that once more from now. Today, I'd like to speak about uh, Bon and the uh, Tibetan Buddhist traditions. And uh, uh, there are many different ways to speak about this, many different points which can be made. And uh, what I would like to uh, speak specifically about is the question of uh, authenticity of uh, traditions and uh, the relationship and uh, harmony between the various uh, traditions of, in Tibet and uh, of Buddhism in general. And uh, from that, go into a uh, discussion of uh, how one can uh, uh, tell about uh, the authenticity of both traditions and spiritual teachers, since there are many spiritual teachers who come in Europe and various parts of the world. And some of them are very good, excellent, and uh, others are very misleading and just trying to get power over the people. And so uh, I think that uh, uh, we can approach this topic not so much as a historical discussion, but more a discussion of uh, how to uh, deal with various traditions and see what is authentic and what is not. Buddha lived in uh, India about two and a half thousand years ago. He was not a god or a creator but a person who was uh, able to uh, see the situation of life that everybody faces. He was able to uh, understand the uh, type of problems that uh, he and everybody faces and uh, was able to discover what the causes of these problems are. He was also then able to uh, discover the various methods for achieving an end to problems uh, that everyone faced and uh, was able to see the techniques to lead to that. And so he was able to overcome his own limitations and shortcomings and realize his own potentials so that he could be the best help to everyone. And he taught that everybody is able to achieve this. Everybody is able to become uh, a Buddha. Buddha means somebody who is totally awake, awake from their own limitations and problems and confusion and awake in the sense that all their energies are directed outwards towards uh, helping others. Now, Buddha taught many different uh, techniques and uh, theories and uh, he always said that uh, everybody is an individual and uh, we need to uh, respect everyone as an individual. And because people have different backgrounds and different types of dispositions, then uh, it's very necessary for there to be many different types of techniques to suit them. There's not just one which uh, everybody must follow in a uh, dogmatic and uh, uh, stiff type of way. And Buddha also said that uh, you shouldn't believe anything that I tell you just out of uh, respect or faith in me, but uh, you should test it out yourself as a buying goal. And so again, Buddha was emphasizing that uh, one should not follow him or any type of spiritual path out of blind faith, but uh, one should always have a critical attitude and uh, test the uh, various uh, teachings and techniques oneself to see if they actually make sense and if they work. And so again, this is based on uh, uh, the uh, extreme respect for people uh, having the ability to discriminate between what is suitable for them and what is not, and what is helpful for them and what is not helpful. Now, when it comes to the question of what is a valid uh, teaching, what is a, a valid technique, uh, it's uh, important to actually then try things out for oneself and uh, compare them to one's own experience. One uh, great Indian Buddhist master, Dharmakirti, uh, said that uh, the uh, definition of a valid teaching is if it is psychologically helpful. In other words, if the uh, technique actually uh, produces the effect 
that uh, it says it uh, is intended to produce and it actually uh, brings about a beneficial transformation of people. It doesn't matter then who the actual author of the technique is as long as it is effective. And all of the Buddhist techniques are intended to be applied on a practical level for overcoming one's problems. They're not just uh, some uh, theoretical teaching uh, for uh, no particular aim or no particular reason, but are all intended to help us to live our lives better, to uh, overcome things like anger, insecurity, and frustration, and worry, and all the usual type of uh, problems that everybody faces. And in addition, it is intended to enable us to uh, work better with others, to have more constructive relations with others, to benefit others on an interpersonal level and also a social level. So from this uh, general guideline of uh, this uh, Indian Buddhist master, then uh, the important criterion for teaching being authentic uh, as a Buddhist teaching is if it produces its effect of uh, helping to eliminate uh, or at least diminish one's own personal uh, problems and also social problems. Uh, when we look at the uh, actual words of the Buddha himself, we find that uh, uh, there are various sutras, these are the original teachings of the Buddha, uh, which were spoken by the Buddha himself, but uh, then there were others which were uh, inspired by the Buddha and uh, not actually delivered by the by him himself. Uh, like, for instance, the Heart Sutra uh, it was uh, spoken by uh, Bodhisattva called Avalokiteshvara uh, through the inspiration of the Buddha. So uh, even going back to the original sutras of the Buddha, we find that uh, not all of them were actually spoken by the Buddha himself. Buddha said, don't rely on uh, the teacher, but uh, on what uh, he or she uh, teaches, and uh, that's an important point, that uh, in Buddhism one should not make a cult out of the teacher, uh, but uh, look at uh, specifically what the person is teaching. And then uh, the uh, next principle along this line of thinking is uh, one should not rely on the words of uh, what the teacher teaches, but uh, on the meaning of the words. Some people are uh, very much drawn to an eloquent speaker, but uh, and the charisma of that speaker, but don't really look at the meaning of what they're saying. And uh, other people are put off, perhaps, by uh, what a good teacher might say, because uh, they're not speaking very grammatically or elegantly. So we want to look at the meaning of what somebody uh, teaches. And then uh, the next principle, we have said in this slide, is that uh, we should not look at uh, uh, rely on just the uh, superficial meaning which needs to be interpreted, but uh, we should look at the deepest uh, meaning of what is intended. Often uh, things are uh, spoken in the uh, Buddhist teachings on the level of an allegory or uh, for uh, some sort of deeper lesson which is to be intended, and uh, we should not just uh, rely literally on uh, some of these uh, explanations or teachings, but look at the point at uh, what they are uh, supposed to uh, lead us to. And then the uh, fourth principle in this line of thinking, Buddha said, uh, and don't rely on a mind that uh, is just dealing with the relative or superficial level to understand this meaning, but uh, rely on a uh, deepest type of understanding of mind which can understand the ultimate or the deepest level of meaning. So uh, one should rely on one's uh, deepest understanding in order to see what is the essence of the teachings. So it's important then to uh, differentiate between uh, two levels of uh, teachings that we find in uh, Buddhism. We have uh, the level that uh, is interpretable that, uh, in other words, needs to be interpreted and it leads to a deeper meaning. And then we have the definitive level to which uh, we are being led. The definitive level 
is uh, the teachings on reality or voidness. The main emphasis in Buddhism is to overcome our problems and uh, our psychological, emotional problems, and social problems come, uh, according to uh, Buddhist teachings, from our confusion. We're confused about reality, and so we project all sorts of fantasies uh, onto uh, ourselves, onto others, and uh, onto situations. Like, uh, we might uh, imagine that uh, there is a, a horrible situation uh, going on, a terrible problem, and uh, we uh, think of it as being something that uh, cannot be solved and has always been there. And uh, so uh, if uh, we look at a, uh, a social problem or an international problem in this way, then uh, we become uh, very overwhelmed by it, and uh, we don't even uh, try to find <coughs> any solution, we just think it's hopeless. But uh, that's not reality, it's being confused uh, about reality and just projecting some fantasy because no problems are uh, things which uh, just uh, exist as uh, one horrible mess that uh, has always been the case and uh, is permanent. But uh, various problems and tensions arise uh, from human uh, reasons from uh, various causes and circumstances, and therefore the reality is that they are dependent on many, many factors to continue them, and if these factors are changed, then uh, the uh, situation will change, and problems can be eliminated. And so uh, all the various teachings that the Buddha gave were intended to uh, lead us to this uh, 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 point namely the understanding of reality, that things do not exist in fantasized ways, as we might imagine, but uh, that everything arises dependent on any causes and circumstances and uh, conceptualizations. So we find uh, various teachings in Buddhism which uh, seem a bit strange to us. We have teachings about, uh, uh, for instance, the uh, shape of the universe, in which uh, uh, we have uh, uh, central Mount Meru, and we have continents around it, and we have all sorts of different realms and different shapes of the planets and so on, which seem rather strange from the point of view of uh, Western science. There are two systems, for instance. One is Abhidharma, which is a system of uh, uh, special knowledge, where Abhidharma means. And, uh, then there's another description of the universe called the Kala Chakra, which is cycles of time. And uh, we have to see what is the whole meaning of it. In other words, uh, when we come across uh, teachers or systems that teach this, what actually are they intending? Are they intending to give a description of the world by which we can navigate a ship? Or is there uh, some other deeper purpose? And uh, here we can see a, a clear example of the deeper purposes to lead us to the understanding of reality. The uh, system of uh, Abhidharma, or special topics of knowledge, uh, gives a very complicated system of all sorts of realms and different types of beings that uh, inhabit it, and uh, a long list of characteristics of all these realms and beings. And then there are two sets of commentaries, and uh, it says, that uh, if uh, when you study it, it says that uh, if you change the characteristics of this realm, or this type of being, how does it change everything else in the system? And so uh, the uh, study of Abhidharma, as is uh, stated uh, in the text, is to help us develop our mind, to develop wisdom. In other words, to work with very complex systems so that uh, we can uh, uh, see how various uh, complex uh, systems work with many variables. So it's intended to give us a type of mind that can then see reality more clearly, and it's not intended to make us uh, believe literally that the Earth is square and flat. The uh, system of uh, Kala Chakra is, uh, 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 gives an alternative uh, description of the universe in which uh, we have uh, the various realms and so on, shaped in the form of the proportions of the human body. And uh, we have a parallel discussion of the uh, human body and the energies within it. 
And so it is setting up a system of a parallel between the macrocosm and the microcosm. And the purpose of it is to understand that uh, the various laws which govern the universe are governing both the external world and the internal world. And uh, these various laws, known as karma, are referring to uh, different types of energies and so on that are affected by the actions of uh, individuals. And uh, if we want to uh, overcome uh, the uh, situation in which uh, both externally and internally we are not really in control, things are being influenced uncontrollably by uh, confusion, that uh, we have to uh, work on uh, overcoming uh, these uh, impulsive energies, both at an external and internal level. So again, it's intended to uh, help us gain a deeper level of wisdom or understanding that the external and internal worlds are very much connected, and uh, we have to work on both of them together. So like this, there are many different types of teachings which on the surface seem a bit strange in uh, but uh, they're not intended to be taken literally. Also, the uh, Buddha emphasized that uh, his teachings should be written in the colloquial language of the times so that uh, everybody can understand them. In fact, in the, uh, one of the texts, the Kalachakra Tantra, uh, it was purposely written in bad Sanskrit in order to break the attachment of uh, Brahmins, who's our uh, religious caste of India, uh, because they were very attached to the sacredness of the Vedas, that's the sacred uh, Indian text, and the Sanskrit language within it. And so, uh, although Buddha said uh, that in general one should write in pleasing language, which is uh, grammatical, so that uh, the world would not look down on the teachers or the teachings as being uneducated, Nevertheless, for various uh, reasons, sometimes one has to uh, write in such a way which will fill some other purpose. So also when we look at uh, whether a teaching is authentic or not, we can't really base that on the type of language in which it's written. So the uh, main point of view from uh, Buddhism is that uh, we always need to use skillful means in order to uh, uh, develop different techniques for helping people. Sometimes we have to explain a whole system uh, which is not really intended to be taken literally, but as a means for developing deeper and deeper understanding and wisdom. Sometimes we have to uh, speak in different types of languages so that people can understand. So when we look then at uh, the history of uh, various Buddhist traditions, then uh, we uh, need to have some sort of criterion for uh, seeing whether or not a tradition is authentic. From a uh, Western scientific point of view, uh, we might say that uh, a system is authentic if it is uh, possible to trace it back to uh, the original teacher, Buddha, and uh, when we look at uh, the different texts and different languages, then uh, since they came later, then uh, some people would say they were really not authentic. Uh, but uh, there's also the Buddhist point of view, which is that uh, things uh, don't, as I said in the beginning, <coughs> quoting from Dharmakirti, that uh, the author is not so relevant uh, so long as the teaching or technique is in the general um, flavor of what the Buddha taught and is helpful for uh, producing the effect that uh, the Buddha spoke of, which is namely liberation from our problems and the ability to help others better. So it's very hard to prove either the Western side or the uh, Buddhist side in uh, approaching the problem of what is authentic. If we look at the life of the uh, Buddha himself, nothing was ever written down at the time of and uh, it was uh, uh, his teachings were just passed on orally. In those days, the uh, written language was uh, only used for business purposes and uh, not for spiritual or educational purposes. And so uh, the uh, uh, teachings of the Buddha uh, 
were uh, in various different types of uh, categories. And uh, the earliest time they were written down was uh, about approximately 400 years after the Buddha lived. And then uh, gradually after that, uh, more and more teachings came to be written down in uh, different languages and so on. And so we get the spread of Buddhism. Now, this isn't really the appropriate place or occasion to uh, give a detailed discussion of the history of the spread of Buddhism throughout Asia. But uh, if we just uh, speak in very general, broad terms, we get uh, three movements in history. One movement is uh, of uh, one set of the Buddhist teachings and techniques uh, traveling down uh, through uh, India to uh, Sri Lanka, and then uh, from Sri Lanka uh, to uh, various parts of Southeast Asia, also through Burma to Southeast Asia. That's the Theravada tradition. Then uh, we have another movement which uh, uh, goes from India into uh, Central Asia, and uh, from uh, Central Asia that spreads to China, and from China to Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. Then, uh, coming a bit later, we have uh, a, another spread of Buddhism going uh, from India up into uh, Tibet. It's the Tibetan area that uh, we'll be concerned with. Uh, when it went to Tibet, which would be uh, approximately the 8th century, then uh, it had already spread to Central Asia and to China, and we get a little bit of influence coming from China, a little bit of influence from Central Asia as well. Then uh, Buddhism had a difficult period in Tibet. There was uh, a great decline, and uh, then again, starting at the end of the 10th century, more in the 11th century, then there was uh, another major movement of uh, Buddhism coming uh, almost totally now from India to Tibet. And then from Tibet it spread uh, throughout Central Asia to Mongolia and uh, Siberia and all the Himalayan regions. So that Tibetan Buddhism covers a vast area all the way from Manchuria, that's north of Korea, over to the Kalmyk Mongol people north of the Caspian Sea all the way from Siberia down to Nepal. So it's a, a very huge area. Now, if we look at uh, uh, how this came into different countries, it uh, always adopted itself to various types of cultures which are found in these areas. And so we get to quite distinctive forms of Buddhism in the different cultural areas, whether it's China, Tibet, or uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, this is in keeping with the techniques that the Buddha said that one should teach in a manner that is going to actually address the problems and the culture of the people. So in Tibet, we had an earlier system of uh, uh, teachings, in, which is known as Bern. And uh, Bern, Bon, neither of which the way it's actually pronounced, it's pronounced Bern to many. But uh, uh, in any case, uh, this is a uh, system which uh, originated in uh, the Persian area of culture, uh, according to uh, its own description. Where exactly in Central Asia that was, it's very difficult to locate. But uh, and when this actually was, is also quite difficult to date. Because uh, in some uh, bone accounts, it says that this comes 30,000 years ago. And uh, there's all sorts of uh, rather uh, extraordinary claims for the uh, ancientness of this tradition. But uh, in any case, it came from uh, an Iranian cultural area, whether in uh, actual uh, Tajikistan, uh, Persia, that type of area, or whether it came from Khotan, that would be in uh, uh, East Turkestan, north of Tibet. In any case, it came into Tibet. We certainly find it by around the uh, first century AD. And uh, it says, according to its own uh, historical account, that there was already a uh, native tradition uh, within Tibet uh, and uh, one adopted to that and was uh, prominent in the kingdom known as Shang Shun, which is in the western region of Tibet. 
And so when uh, Buddhism came from uh, India, uh, then uh, there was already a native tradition within Tibet. Now, there's a, a, a long history then of adaptation of uh, Buddhism to the uh, type of cultural things that uh, one was involved with. Like, uh, for instance, uh, in the original uh, early Bon teachings, there's an emphasis on uh, healing. And uh, so uh, one wants to uh, first do some type of divination in order to uh, determine uh, where the source of the sickness is, whether it's being caused by harmful spirits or uh, uh, what particular type of harmful spirits uh, it might be caused from, or if it's due to some imbalance in the environment, etc. There could be many causes of uh, illness. So this is determined by divination, like looking at knots on ropes and so on. Later on in the Tibetan tradition, there's a form of divination with dice that develops. Then uh, one uh, wants to uh, uh, consult an astrologer. So there's a whole development of astrology here uh, to see that uh, if there are certain rituals that need to be done to overcome the force of uh, harmful spirits or imbalance externally, then uh, one would consult the astrologer as to when would be the appropriate time for uh, uh, doing uh, a particular ritual. And then there are the actual rituals which are done which are primarily dealing with uh, balancing the external elements in order to bring about a uh, balance of the internal elements within a person. And then there's the actual medical techniques which are done. It doesn't just do a ceremony and expect uh, someone to be healed, but uh, if uh, one does a ceremony and combines that with a uh, medical approach of uh, medicine and so on, then uh, one can bring about a better type of cure. So uh, we have this type of system in uh, ancient uh, Bon. We also have uh, rituals for burying the kings, and these type of things, which are uh, uh, further things. But uh, there was a uh, development of the kingdom of Tibet itself which uh, in central Tibet, which conquered this uh, ancient kingdom of Shangshong, which had gone as its uh, state religion. And uh, gradually, it was uh, looking at various philosophical systems, and Buddhism was uh, adopted, and Bon was rejected. Now, we can say, well, this is an example of uh, uh, great sectarianism. On one level, it is, but on another level, it uh, is uh, primarily a uh, politically motivated uh, action which took place. We have uh, the uh, original ancient uh, tradition of Buddhism that uh, first came uh, from primarily India to Tibet at this time, which was known as Nyingma. And then uh, there was a period of decline. Now, during this period of decline, we find that uh, uh, a great many of the teachings of uh, the Buddhist system of Nyingma and uh, the uh, Bon system were buried and uh, hidden uh, because the times were very difficult and there was persecution. And uh, then later, starting in the uh, 11th century, these texts came to be rediscovered. And so we find a very similar type of system of discovering hidden texts or treasure texts in the Bon tradition as well as in the Nyingma tradition. Also at this time, we get uh, uh, a new wave of Buddhism coming into uh, Tibet, as I said, at the end of the 10th and uh, in the 11th century. And this eventually developed into uh, the Sakya, the Kagyu, and later the Guluk tradition of uh, Tibet. And we find many, many things which are not only held in common by these four traditions of Tibet, the Yingma tradition being one that revived from the hidden teachings, but uh, also we find that many of these features are held in common with Bon as well. So for instance, uh, there's a whole tradition of debate in uh, India, philosophical debate in Buddhism, which uh, we find in the early Bon monasteries as well as in uh, the uh, Buddhist monasteries. We find all the various categories of Buddhist literature 
are also uh, in the bone literature. We find that uh, they all have uh, um, similar types of rituals. We find a similar type of music. We find uh, that although the monks and nuns' vows are all the same in the four Buddhist traditions, the uh, bone has its own variant of it, which are remarkably similar as well. The robes are nearly identical, just uh, they wear blue in one portion of it instead of red and yellow. And uh, they have a system of reincarnate uh, lamas, just like in Buddhism. And everything looks practically the same. So uh, we uh, can uh, ask, well, what's going on here? From the uh, Vaughan point of view, they say that, uh, well, we had all these teachings originally, and Buddhists are uh, copying it from us. And the Buddhists would say that, no, we had the teachings originally, and the Vaughan uh, practitioners are copying it. But uh, that's something which is very difficult to resolve. In some of the uh, most recent theories of uh, Western scholars is that uh, Buddhism, as I had mentioned, had gone much earlier into uh, Central Asia, starting in the first century BC. And uh, when Vaughan says that its original teachings came from the uh, Persian uh, cultural area of Central Asia, it's quite possible that what came in at that time was an earlier version of Buddhism. And so that uh, it's not unreasonable to say that uh, many of the traditions which are found later in Buddhism might have already been in this uh, very early one, having come from an earlier spread of Buddhism. Well, they would say that it came from Buddha, that seems to have been uh, forgotten. But uh, in any case, it's quite possible to have had a separate source of uh, these teachings other than the uh, direct uh, uh, transmission from India at the time when Buddhism came to uh, Tibet. Also, uh, if we look within the Nyingma system, there's a set of teachings known as Zong Chen, the Great Completeness, which is dealing with a uh, uh, very detailed and uh, profound analysis of the mind, how the mind works. And uh, these teachings were uh, most prominent in uh, an area called uh, Gilgit, which is in uh, northern Pakistan. And uh, Bob was also quite popular in that area as well. And so it's quite possible for there to have been a separate transmission of those teachings uh, to Bon in Tibet from Gilgit and not directly from India uh, through uh, the line of transmission from Nyingma. So it's very hard to uh, settle this question of uh, which one is authentic, the uh, Bon or the uh, Buddhist, and which one is the actual source of the teachings. But if we look at the general principles which uh, were laid down by the Buddha and uh, by the Indian Buddhist teachers afterwards, it really is not important uh, who was the source of uh, these teachings. The point is, do they work? And do they actually produce the goal that uh, they say that they are intending for? Uh, whether we speak of Bong or we speak of Tibetan Buddhism, they all are aiming at the same thing, liberation from problems and enlightenment of the state of a Buddha. Some of the uh, terminology is different in from uh, the uh, Buddhist traditions. And within the Buddhist traditions themselves in Tibet, there's a slightly different terminology and different use of the terminology. But again, we saw from the earlier principles that Buddhists said, speak in different languages uh, so that uh, different people would be able to understand them. So although there is a, uh, a history of uh, difficulty in Tibet, various sectarian difficulties, and so on, uh, against Bon or against this tradition or that tradition of Buddhism. If one looks more deeply, one uh, usually finds that these are primarily political disputes that uh, have taken place in the name of different uh, Buddhist uh, or religious sects and are not really uh, religious wars as such more political wars and uh, disputes. If we look at the present time, then uh, we find that, uh, for instance, in 1988, I believe it was, there was a conference in uh, Sarnath, India, of uh, the incarnate lamas of uh, all Tibetan traditions. And it was held by uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, 
as the spiritual leader of Tibet, and he called for a meeting of the five traditions of Tibet. And uh, he made a very strong point that uh, Bon is one of the uh, five traditions. Whether we call it Buddhist or uh, they themselves would not want to be called Buddhist, but uh, in any case, Bon and the four Tibetan traditions of Buddhism form a larger unit uh, which is uh, basically in harmony with each other, sharing many, many things in common and differing primarily in slight ritual things, terminology, emphasis, and approach. But basically, they all fit together harmoniously, and they're all authentic. So that brings us to the second half of uh, what I want to speak about, which is, uh, well, is everything authentic? Is everything valid? Or uh, are there some uh, spiritual traditions or spiritual teachers that uh, we have to be careful about? Now, in uh, March of uh, this year, 1993, there was uh, the first conference of uh, uh, Western teachers of Buddhism, which was held in Dharamsala, India, with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And uh, these were uh, Westerners who teach uh, all the various traditions of Buddhism in the West, whether it's Tibetan or uh, uh, Japanese, Chinese, uh, Thai, Burmese, or whatever it might be. And uh, one of the major themes of this uh, conference was uh, the problem of cults and sects and uh, the uh, problem of misleading teachers and charlatans who are going around in the name of Buddhism, although this is not limited to Buddhism, uh, but other uh, spiritual traditions as well, and uh, who are abusing students who are just interested in gaining power over people and uh, controlling them, who are abusing students sexually or uh, for money, trying to get uh, as many uh, fancy cars from them as possible, or who are acting in uh, general ways which are uh, unethical, like uh, being alcoholics or abusive of drugs, or uh, in general acting in uh, very uh, unusual ways that are damaging to themselves and to others, and totally uh, not in accordance with uh, the teachings of the Buddha. And so uh, there was a, a great deal of concern. There's been a lot of damage to uh, Buddhism and to students and to teachers because of this. And so it is very important uh, to test out teachers and to test out teachings and always to be critical. As uh, I mentioned at the beginning, Buddha said that uh, one should not accept uh, what he said out of respect or faith, but to test it out oneself as if buying gold. And so uh, in the West, we find that uh, many people, when they approach spiritual traditions, whether Buddhist or non-Buddhist, do not have this type of critical attitude. First of all, there are uh, many people who are uh, uh, very disillusioned by uh, their own traditions, who are very confused and who are looking for uh, some deeper answers to their lives. And so they turn to uh, oriental things. Now, uh, uh, sometimes we have uh, people who have exploited uh, oriental uh, teachings in order to uh, try to uh, uh, get a better position for themselves, get more power, and so on. And so they present uh, Buddhism let's say Tibetan Buddhism, as being something very exotic and esoteric and occult. But uh, this is uh, either due to their own misunderstanding, or uh, more usually, it's due to uh, the wish to become popular themselves, to attract a large audience. So uh, we have uh, people like, for instance, uh, Bosan Rampa, who was a, a British plumber, who uh, wrote uh, fantasy novels about Tibet, and uh, he made it uh, interesting and very occult and exciting, but uh, it really has very little to do with the reality of Tibet or of Buddhism. 
certainly nobody in Tibet drills a hole in their forehead or other people's foreheads in order to open a third eye. That's a bit uh, preposterous. And uh, people don't go flying through the air and so on. And so one has to uh, be very careful. Somebody like Wolfson Ramba has uh, introduced many people to Tibet. And so in that sense, uh, he has uh, provided a good service but uh, and has been helpful in that sense. But again, as we uh, uh, saw uh, earlier in this talk, there are some uh, explanations that are intended to lead us more deep and are not to be taken literally. And certainly what Lopsang uh, Rampa taught it is not to be taken literally at all. But uh, if they uh, excite our interest in uh, Tibetan Buddhism or in Tibetan culture, then we should try to go a little bit more deeper and uh, try to uh, understand and learn the actual teachings and situation of Tibet. There are others who uh, might have uh, uh, made up all sorts of fantastic systems and teachings in order to attract people. And uh, these one has to uh, be very careful of. Also, uh, Western people, when they uh, approach uh, oriental things, often uh, bring with them what I call a football team mentality. And so uh, they'd like to uh, look at one particular tradition as my football team, and this is the best, this is the only one, and uh, all the other traditions are good. And uh, so uh, they claim that they're the only authentic ones, everybody else is wrong, and this is based, again, on uh, some type of uh, insecurity, uh, they want to have their own system be right, and uh, everything else is wrong, this is certainly not. Uh, the approach of uh, the Buddha. Also, uh, when we uh, look at this phenomenon of uh, people turning to uh, sects or uh, cults or becoming very sectarian and close-minded or attracted to occult things, uh, we have an additional uh, phenomenon in, here in uh, uh, the part of uh, Europe that had been under the communist rule and uh, have been under a totalitarian system. What often has happened is that uh, in countries, we've seen this uh, quite widely, uh, where uh, there was a totalitarian past, then uh, people got into the habit of not really taking responsibility themselves for making decisions and uh, for uh, deciding what actually is uh, best or proper to uh, follow. And so after the fall of uh, these totalitarian regimes, then uh, people were all of a sudden faced with a situation in which they needed to take responsibility themselves to make their own decisions, their own choices, either economic or uh, in terms of uh, uh, philosophical or political systems, and so on. And for a lot of people, this uh, new freedom was something that uh, made them very insecure. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, all of a sudden take responsibility. One doesn't really know how to do that or what to choose or what to decide. And when people have uh, been in this state of mind, then what often has happened is that uh, spiritual leaders come along or nationalistic leaders come along and they say, just follow me, I will tell you what is best, what to do, and so on. And uh, that people being insecure have just uh, given their allegiance to these leaders and said, yes, tell me what to do, I will follow you blindly. And uh, this has been very unfortunate, both on a spiritual level and on a nationalistic and uh, political level. So this is really the problem here, is that uh, people need to always maintain uh, a critical attitude and to take responsibility themselves to decide what is proper, what is not proper, what is helpful, and what is harmful. And this was very much the message of the Buddha when uh, approaching spiritual matters, that uh, one should always uh, look very, very carefully and examine. Now, we could uh, ask then, what are the qualifications 
of a, uh, a spiritual teacher, as is outlined in the Buddhist tradition. And when we uh, uh, look in the various texts, there are many lists of qualifications. The main uh, ones are, first of all, uh, for the teacher to be uh, strongly ethical in uh, his or her behavior. No matter uh, who a teacher might be, uh, no matter what level of realization they might have or claim that they have, nobody is uh, beyond ethics. And so uh, when we find teachers who uh, are uh, abusing uh, students or who are alcoholic or uh, who are abusing drugs or uh, who are uh, just uh, trying to get uh, money and so on, sex for students, then uh, this is obviously very much against the basic uh, principles of ethics as is outlined by the uh, Buddha. Also, the uh, main motivation of the teacher should be compassion and concern for the students, not for uh, gaining uh, power and control themselves. And so it was stated very clearly at this meeting with the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala by His Holiness and uh, other uh, Tibetan spiritual leaders and uh, heads of traditions who attended. And uh, they uh, said very clearly that uh, no matter what someone's relationship with the teacher might be, or who that teacher might be, and regardless of how beneficial the teachings of that teacher might be, nevertheless, if that teacher is acting in an unethical manner, one should confront that teacher. One should just uh, let the teacher get away with uh, abusing the students. And uh, so uh, one should uh, say to the teacher, you're asking, uh, all the students to go to bed with you or uh, uh, to just follow you blindly is not in accordance with what the Buddha taught. Why are you doing this? Why are you saying this? I don't understand. Now, this is something which is very much uh, part of the Buddhist tradition. When we look at, uh, for instance, one Indian Buddhist text by uh, Ashvagosha, which is 50 stanzas on the spiritual teacher, he says that uh, one uh, should not just uh, obey a teacher blindly, but if a teacher asks us to do something which uh, we cannot do or which seems unreasonable, that uh, we should still res have respect for the teacher, but respectfully ask, why are you saying this? And if we cannot do it, then uh, we should politely excuse ourselves. There's a story of this from one of the previous lives of the Buddha. In a previous life, the Buddha was a disciple of one teacher who asked all the students to go out and steal for him. And all the students went out and did that. But uh, the Buddha stayed in his room. So the teacher came to him and said, why don't you go out and steal for me? Don't you want to make me happy? And the Buddha said, how can stealing make anybody happy? And the teacher said, aha, you are the only one who understood the point of the lesson. So like this, it's uh, important to uh, always remember that uh, the role of a spiritual teacher is not that of a general in the army. And the relationship of the student to the teacher is not that of a private in the army that just says, yes, sir, and obeys like a uh, mindless robot. But uh, one must always uh, uh, develop one's mind and question and be critical. The uh, whole purpose of uh, a spiritual teacher and the relationship with a spiritual teacher in Buddhism is to enable us uh, as students to grow and become a Buddha ourselves. So a teacher is helping us to stand on our own two feet and make our own decisions for ourselves. And so if a teacher tells us to uh, not make any decisions and just blindly follow him or her, then again, we must uh, confront this teacher and ask, why are you saying this? Why are you doing this? This is not part of the teachings of the Buddha. And uh, as Holiness said, if uh, when confronted with either their unethical behavior or their behavior of trying to just control students and make them into robots, if uh, teachers do not uh, change their habits and stop from this, then uh, it is best to advertise in newspapers and publicize this misconduct by the teachers, no matter who the teacher might be. 
one shouldn't deny the good qualities of this teacher. The teacher might be an excellent teacher, writing excellent books, which would be very helpful for people. But this particular aspect of their conduct and behavior, it should be pointed out in the papers clearly, is not in accordance with the teachings of the Buddha and uh, is not representative of the Buddhist tradition, and uh, therefore we call upon that teacher to stop this type of behavior. And uh, perhaps in this way, it will embarrass the teachers to uh, actually uh, uh, improve their conduct to be more ethical and moral and in accordance with uh, Buddhist teachings. Also, as uh, I said, uh, Buddha had respect for all different traditions, all different techniques, and uh, said that it's very important to have these different techniques. If uh, there were only one food in the world, then uh, this would be very boring. It might not suit everybody. So it's very good that there are many different types of food. So likewise, the same thing with spiritual paths. It's very good that uh, there are many because uh, they will suit different people. And even for one individual, different uh, techniques might be suitable at different times in his or her life. So uh, if uh, we come across a teacher who is extremely sectarian, and closed-minded and wants to make uh, uh, their uh, followers into some type of cult, uh, saying that you should only follow me, nobody else is good, nobody else is qualified, or you should only follow my lineage, and all the <coughs> lineages are wrong and bad, then uh, this is clearly a sign that this teacher is not following the principles laid out by the Buddha himself. And so again, one must confront the teacher with this uh, type of uh, 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 promoting this type of attitude and question this teacher. In the uh, traditional texts of uh, Buddhism about the relation with the teacher, it says that uh, we should uh, continue to uh, uh, test the teacher for as long as 12 years that uh, one shouldn't jump very quickly into a uh, relationship uh, with the teacher uh, because uh, this is something which is very serious. said that uh, the relationship should not be like uh, that of a, a hungry dog that's starving, just uh, immediately jumps at uh, any scrap of food that is thrown to it. But uh, one should be very careful and test and see uh, what really the spiritual teacher is all about and uh, what are their teachings. Also, it's important to uh, realize that uh, there are many different levels of uh, teachers. And just to go to a lecture of somebody doesn't mean that they become our spiritual guide. Uh, we are free to go to the lecture of anyone, since uh, uh, was emphasized by the Solis the Dalai Lama, and uh, that doesn't imply anything. Uh, we can learn from uh, everybody. In fact, uh, one of the uh, guidelines is to look at everybody as a teacher. Uh, even if somebody is acting completely uh, um, improperly, we can learn from that person not to act like that. So uh, we can learn from anybody, but that doesn't make them our spiritual guide. We uh, uh, find that uh, there are more advanced students who uh, are uh, uh, able to uh, explain their experience and share their uh, knowledge and uh, so on with others. And this is one level of spiritual teacher. Uh, not spiritual teacher, but uh, oh, okay, spiritual teacher. And uh, for that type of teacher, or any other type of teacher, it's important to be humble, to uh, acknowledge when uh, I don't know something, to say, I don't know, not to pretend that one has uh, greater qualities or greater understanding than uh, one has. To uh, pretend that one has higher insight than one has uh, is uh, breaking all the uh, vows or rules of uh, um, the various practice. Then uh, beyond uh, just a more experienced uh, older student, uh, who shares their knowledge and experience with us. We uh, have uh, uh, certain teachers who in some traditions are called lamas. Yeah, lama is uh, a very uh, difficult word because it means different things in uh, different traditions. Uh, another thing that came out of this uh, conference of Western teachers 
was that Ms. Olenna said it's much better for Western people not to use Oriental titles, call themselves Lama this or Roshi that, uh, or Guru this or uh, Swami that. But uh, because uh, this leads to a great deal of uh, mystification and misunderstanding. If one has to use titles at all, one should use titles from one's own language. But uh, in any case, we have uh, in some traditions the word Lama is basically like a village priest. There are people who have done intensive practices for three years, for instance, and learned the rituals of their tradition. And uh, in Tibet, they would go to uh, villages and perform rituals for people and uh, would be able to teach others uh, the uh, rituals up to the level that they themselves had studied. And so we can learn from teachers uh, like this as well. Then beyond that, in the Tibetan tradition, we have uh, what's known as Rinpoche's, uh, who are uh, uh, much more learned teachers who uh, have uh, an understanding not only of rituals, but uh, of a uh, uh, much wider field of knowledge and learning. And they can teach uh, to a, a larger extent many other things. And then we have uh, the greatest teachers, like the Dalai Lama, who uh, has the largest uh, sphere of uh, activities and uh, knowledge and experience that uh, he can teach. So uh, we shouldn't expect that uh, every teacher that comes has the same level of expertise and the same level of competence. But uh, we should have a realistic attitude towards all of them and uh, especially watch out to see that they are humble and not uh, pretentious or pretending that they have qualities when they don't. And uh, if one wants to uh, take a teacher as one's spiritual guide uh, to actually direct us personally in our practice, then uh, this is something that takes a very long period of time of uh, examination. And even when we have chosen a teacher uh, to be our guide, still uh, we shouldn't just blindly follow that person uh, as if we were in the army. But uh, as his Holiness the Dalai Lama himself says, I don't like people just following me blindly, and uh, people should always uh, be critical of me and uh, give their own opinions and their own advice uh, and suggestions. So that uh, in this way, there's always a uh, uh, respect for <coughs> individuals, and nobody as a teacher is manipulating anybody else. So it is very important in uh, the modern age to uh, look at uh, the uh, various teachers that uh, come around and uh, the teachings themselves, and to try to uh, be critical ourselves as to what and who is authentic and uh, who and what is inauthentic, or just trying to take advantage of people's uh, desperation and need and people's naivety in order to gain power for themselves and uh, to exploit the uh, situation. But uh, if we have uh, always a critical attitude, if we're always open to uh, many traditions and seeing that uh, uh, the various uh, traditions that uh, have authentic backgrounds are uh, um, intended to help others, they don't have to have actually originated thousands of years ago. As Dr. Kirti said, if the technique is psychologically helpful to produce its effect, it doesn't matter who the author was. There are many uh, teachings which came in both Rabban and in Tibetan Buddhism from various visions uh, and so on, which have been very helpful, which have been in accordance with uh, the principles. But again, one doesn't just accept things because they come from a vision or because uh, somebody is channeling a spirit uh, in a trance and uh, speaking, having somebody speak through them. There can be spirits that uh, are uh, wise and give helpful uh, teachings. There are also ones that uh, fool people and uh, try to get uh, control themselves. They're no different from uh, human beings. So uh, no matter what uh, aspect and angle we're approaching spiritual teachings from, it's uh, always important to be critical and have our eyes open. The game in uh, Buddhism or in Bon is to become fully awake as a Buddha. And uh, so if the goal is to be fully awake, 
then the path to that goal must also be one in which one uh, always tries to be as awake as possible. So, are there any questions? I have a question. Yes. Uh, the of Buddha includes the idea of the frank dimension. teachings of Buddha include the uh, teachings on reincarnation? Uh, yes, they do, actually. In, uh, it occurs in the teachings on karma and uh, on a general cycle of uh, existence, that uh, no matter uh, what type of uh, situation we might be born in, there are various problems and so on. And so uh, one wants to uh, deal with these problems. Also, uh, the teachings on rebirth deal with the idea that uh, uh, if uh, we haven't dealt with our problems in uh, this life, that uh, the impulses that are generating these problems and the confusion will continue into future lives as well. And so death is not an escape from uh, our problems, but uh, one has to try to face one's problems and deal with them now. But uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama said something very interesting about this. Uh, uh, it was said that uh, he thinks that uh, even without the belief in rebirth, it's uh, quite possible to follow the Buddhist path. In other words, to be a kind person, to uh, try to uh, help mm -hmm. others and uh, see reality. It's not necessary to have to think in terms of past and future lives. One should uh, try to uh, uh, get down to the most essential point. The most essential point, as uh, we were discussing before, is to see reality and to help others. Is Buddhism a religion or mostly or abstinence at all? The question is, is Buddhism a religion, a philosophy, or perhaps a psychology? And uh, again, uh, in Buddhism, one would say uh, that uh, what things are depends on the point of view and the function and uh, the uh, way in which it's used. So for instance, uh, this uh, could be a glass of water, this could also be a vase for flowers, and it could also be a small aquarium for a little fish. So uh, what is this? Is this a, uh, a drinking glass, a vase, or an aquarium? It's the same type of question. And uh, so if uh, Buddhism is represented uh, at an ecumenical meeting, let's say uh, like the ones organized by His Holiness the Pope uh, of uh, various world religions, then certainly Buddhism is a world religion. If uh, we look at uh, Buddhism from the point of view of its teachings about uh, reality, and uh, how to, and, uh, how uh, things exist uh, dependent on uh, the mind that sees it, and then on causes, circumstances, etc., and its whole development of logic, then it's certainly a philosophy. If we look at it from the point of view of its teachings on the emotions, and uh, how psychological problems arise, and how to uh, deal with them and overcome them, then it's a psychology. So it really depends on the function and the attitude, the angle of which one's looking at. But it certainly is not a religion in the sense of a biblical religion coming out of the, the biblical tradition of uh, the Near East. Right. Yes.
who uh, came from uh, India before, and Shantar uh, Rakshita was his name, and uh, he uh, uh, was invited by the king of Tibet to uh, bring Buddhist teachings there. Unfortunately, at the time, uh, there was also a smallpox epidemic, and uh, he was uh, blamed a little bit for that, and so he was sent out of Tibet. So then he came again after uh, a number of years and uh, started to uh, 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 set up a uh, monastery uh, with the king. There were various uh, difficulties which were involved, and so uh, they invited uh, Sambhala to uh, come to uh, Tibet to uh, help uh, quiet some of the uh, difficulties which were going on. So uh, Sambhala brought various uh, transmissions of teachings to Tibet and uh, was able to uh, uh, bring into uh, the uh, Tibetan situation various uh, protecting spirits, for instance, uh, to uh, become the protectors of uh, uh, Buddhism in Tibet and contributed uh, a great deal to uh, the early establishment of uh, Buddhism there. So uh, he certainly is seen uh, with the highest respect by all the traditions of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, not just the Nyingma tradition, uh, which uh, followed from him, as being uh, probably the uh, most uh, important figure for uh, bringing Buddhism to Tibet and uh, quieting down uh, hostilities. And uh, he is still uh, looked upon very much by all Tibetans as uh, a figure for uh, inspiration for quieting down difficult uh, circumstances and situations, especially situations that are hostile to uh, spiritual development and growth. Do you know uh, anything about the teaching? Let's say these treasure classes are now being distributed through the world, and this is a dharma, hidden teachings from master parents and the question is, uh, there is a specific uh, tradition of treasure vases which uh, has uh, uh, gained some popularity in uh, uh, Europe. And uh, one tradition of it comes from Guru Rinpoche, the Padma Sabama. Do I know anything about it? Actually, I don't. But we find uh, treasure vases in uh, various uh, traditions, not just uh, coming from uh, Guru Rinpoche, and uh, they are uh, intended uh, to try to bring a balance in uh, the external environment in order to uh, bring about uh, more um, prosperity, uh, not just on an economic level, but uh, prosperity in the sense that conditions are conducive for spiritual growth. But uh, the actual specifics of it I'm uh, unfamiliar with. But with any particular teaching or tradition in Buddhism, I think it's very important not to get caught up with uh, a ritual aspect. But uh, as uh, uh, I described, there are two types of teachings, those which are intended to lead us deeper and uh, those which are uh, uh, concerning the deepest level that we are to be led to. And the deepest level of the teachings on reality, which uh, uh, enable us to overcome our problems and help others the best. So uh, when we find various rituals which are uh, dealing with, uh, for instance, harmonizing the environment around us and, uh, uh, and so on, we should see the deeper meaning of this. The deeper meaning of this is to try to gain conducive circumstances so that we can then go deeper and understand reality and overcome our projections and fantasies and confusion and help others more. Don't just get caught up in a, a uh, exotic, attractive ritual. Yes. What is the deeper meaning of the growth of the influence of the Chinese? The question is, what is the deeper meaning of the growth of Chinese influence in Tibet? You mean modern situation? Yes, but why are they so opposed to the spiritual growth? Right. If, uh, so, uh, about the modern situation in uh, Tibet, 
uh, Tibet was uh, an independent country that uh, was invaded by China in uh, by the communist forces of China in 1950, and uh, then. Uh, the Chinese progressively have uh, tried to incorporate uh, Tibet uh, as part of China uh, through a, a very oppressive type of uh, uh, policy uh, of the 6 million Ch uh, Tibetans, 1.2 million have died in concentration camps or from forced labor or from the uh, economic disasters uh, that have come from the uh, implementation of the Chinese policy. China said destroyed about 95% of the monasteries in Tibet, uh, but deforested uh, large parts of Tibet that they could reach so that uh, there are uh, um, ecological disasters of uh, erosion, which is uh, uh, causing the major rivers of Asia, which flow from Tibet, to flood. So we have these huge floods in Bangladesh and India, and a uh, huge number of dying as a result of this. The Chinese are dumping nuclear wastes in uh, Tibet, so that uh, this is also uh, not only uh, damaging people there, but also has implications beyond uh, Tibet. So uh, this whole issue of Tibet is not uh, an internal issue of China, but affects uh, the whole area of Asia. The Chinese are also uh, moving in a huge number of popul Chinese population in Tibet, so that now the Chinese outnumber the Tibetans in their own country. The Chinese claim that they're building a great many hospitals, schools, housing, roads, etc. But if one examines more deeply, this is all intended for uh, the Chinese settlers and not for the use of the Tibetans. But the roads are for bringing the military into uh, Tibet. Uh, they're gross violations of uh, human rights and so on. And uh, it's a very, very difficult situation for Tibet. If we look at uh, a, uh, what is a deeper meaning of this, or what can be learned from it, as uh, the Holiness Dalai Lama says, one's enemies are really one's best friends and uh, one's greatest teachers. Because uh, if everybody treats us like a baby, then uh, we never grow, we never learn. But uh, if uh, we are challenged uh, the most, by difficult situations, then uh, it uh, really inspires us to grow and to overcome these difficulties. Uh, we can see this in many parts of the world. And so as a result of uh, this uh, Chinese occupation and uh, the uh, Dalai Lama uh, leaving Tibet in 1959 with 100,000 refugees, then uh, the uh, Buddhist teachings of Tibet and Paul are uh, much uh, more widely available, more widely known in the world. And uh, so this has been uh, very helpful. It uh, also uh, has, uh, um, it, what should we say, moved the uh, Tibetans to go further in the direction that they were already going, already the Dalai Lama, and uh, acknowledged that uh, the system in Tibet was uh, in need of reform, and uh, was starting to reform it before the Chinese came in, and uh, after the Chinese uh, in exile, uh, the Tibetan government has formed a new constitution according to democratic uh, principles. They're revising that uh, constitution to uh, be more in line with uh, the experience that they've learned over these years. And so on many levels, uh, there has been uh, growth. But in Tibet itself, uh, certainly there has been a tremendous amount of destruction. Uh, there has been a uh, policy of genocide uh, towards the Tibetans. There are uh, many uh, forced sterilizations of uh, women, forced abortions. Uh, in general, the, uh, there's the whole policy to uh, make Tibet Chinese, uh, with Chinese people, and diminish the uh, Tibetan population. So what have the Tibetans learned from this? I don't know, I think the, one of the major things is that uh, the Tibetans have become even more nationalistic, even more devoted to uh, their religions, and uh, even more determined to uh, have uh, freedom. Uh, one doesn't uh, uh, convince others to uh, act in certain ways by being violent and cruel. 
one that I can convince others through kindness. Someone is the Dalai Lama. This is a very nice example for that. He uh, went to uh, one of these large aquariums where they have uh, these trained uh, sea animals. And they have this very large killer whale, just an enormous uh, animal. And uh, he said it's really quite amazing because uh, they can train this animal to do all sorts of tricks, this fish, just by giving it a small little fish to eat. Now, if you look at it, you know, just giving this killer whale a small little fish doesn't really satisfy the hunger of the killer whale, but it's the token of kindness that uh, causes this killer whale to be trained and to follow what the people uh, uh, ask it to do. Whereas if you whipped it and beat it, you would never get it to uh, uh, follow what you wanted. So if we see this case in the room with animals and fish, then certainly this is the case with uh, human beings. And uh, I think we find this uh, certainly in uh, the experience of this part of the world. Under totalitarianism, one just has a stronger determination to be free. So this has been also a result of the Chinese occupation of Tibet. Yes? Uh, in China, uh, there is a similar teaching in Taoism. Right. Uh, considering the situation in Tibet, Taoism did not succeed in general in China. Uh, do you believe that uh, Buddhism has any more chances to succeed as a teacher in the world? In Tibet, or in the world, or China? In China, no, but in general. Well, the uh, question is, does uh, Buddhism have uh, more of a chance of succeeding in uh, the world than uh, So this type of uh, aspect of uh, Buddhism 
and its clear explanations, particularly of techniques of overcoming uh, psychological problems like selfishness and anger and greed and insecurity, uh, are things which uh, um, attract many people and I think uh, will bring about the uh, uh, lasting of uh, Buddhism in uh, the world. However, you also have people who are attracted to occult esoteric aspects of it. Again, I think that uh, is the result of uh, certain misleading teachers trying to represent it in an occult esoteric way in order to attract more people to themselves. And that is not really the essence of uh, Buddhism. But uh, when we speak of Buddhism uh, lasting in the world, then uh, it certainly is going to be something that uh, will adopt to the different cultures, just as Buddhism adopted to the different cultures of Asia Likewise, it uh, will adopt to the different uh, cultures outside of Asia. This is something which is only natural and to be expected. However, when his holiness of God on says this, he says that uh, if you look at the people who uh, traditionally were involved in that adaptation to Asian cultures, uh, this didn't happen just in the first 20 or 30 years of uh, contact. This happened and was done by great masters who had uh, a complete knowledge of all the Buddhist teachings and uh, were very familiar with the culture from which it came and their own culture. And only when one has a, a very vast knowledge of uh, all the systems involved can one then see what aspects of the Buddhist teachings uh, could be emphasized more in this culture and which aspects uh, should perhaps be emphasized less. And so this is the way that uh, is adapted over a slow, gradual process uh, based on a tremendous amount of uh, experience and uh, understanding. But in this way, I think it will succeed, and it is succeeding. That's why uh, it's so important to uh, discriminate between uh, the uh, charlatan misleading teachers of Buddhism, who uh, we find among uh, Asians as well as Westerners uh, teaching Buddhism, from the authentic teachers. There are many excellent authentic teachers, but because of a few uh, misleading teachers, or because of the unethical conduct of certain teachers who might in fact be teaching uh, very well otherwise, still it's causing a very bad name for Buddhism and a great deal of damage for the uh, students and for the teachers themselves. Therefore, uh, uh, there is this uh, great movement now of uh, people who are very concerned to uh, uh, try to uh, help overcome this uh, unfortunate aspect which has arisen in Buddhism and other uh, oriental traditions as well. Not only oriental traditions, we find fanaticism, we find uh, uh, cults in uh, Western traditions as well. This is something that uh, uh, needs to be uh, addressed and overcome by looking at the reasons and causes for why do people turn to this? Why do people give their faith to uh, these uh, uh, teachers, these misleading uh, leaders? And to try to correct that and see that the fault is not in uh, spiritual teachings or following a spiritual path but the fault is in people's insecurity and uh, various leaders with charisma trying to take advantage of that insecurity for their own personal gain. But that is the case in the teachings. What do you think of the Nothing bad, but the result is the same. Right, well, the this is... is 2,000 years old, mm -hmm. nearly as, I think, the Buddhism is not much, much younger than yeah. But there is no result. Well, I wouldn't say that. The, the comment is that uh, we find a similar type of thing with communism and uh, Christianity, that uh, there are many people who uh, exploit it. And uh, uh, the teachings themselves are excellent. Uh, there's no great fault in the way in which they've been implemented. has been very unfortunate. This is something that uh, as long as the Dalai Lama says as well about uh, communism, for instance that uh, in the teachings of Marx, when you uh, look at social responsibility and so on, there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, again, the way that it has been implemented in a totalitarian way, 
Uh, that is something which is very unfortunate. But just because in the history of mankind we can find many examples of uh, uh, people and leaders uh, who have misled or been misled, that doesn't mean that everybody in uh, history has been uh, uh, misleading. There are leaders, uh, there are great spiritual figures who have not been that way. And uh, so one must uh, look at the good examples and uh, beware of the negative examples to avoid them. I don't think that uh, one can say that it's hopeless, but uh, you need to take responsibility and develop discrimination. Yes? Uh, I'm actually I'm interested in certain uh, specific uh, traditions that exist in Tibetan Buddhism and which, uh, for instance, like the use uh, of human bones for certain rituals or mm -hmm. jumps made of human mm -hmm. skin and things like that. Is it coming from uh, an influence from the bone? Or is it from earlier the kind of shamanistic tradition that existed in uh, Tibet even earlier? Well, the question is in both bone and the question is about the use of uh, human bones in various uh, ritual uh, instruments. And uh, does this come from bone uh, from uh, earlier Tibetan tradition, or where does it come from? And it actually comes from India. Uh, we find that uh, in uh, various uh, Indian texts as well, it talks about uh, ritual implements and jewelry made from bones. And uh, the uh, significance of it, again, it's something to lead us deeper. It's not that people go out and rob graves and uh, kill people in order to get their bones and use them in magic rituals. Certainly not that, but uh, uh, which, uh, of course, early missionaries who went to Tibet fantasized and imagined that that was the case. But uh, rather, it, uh, the use of uh, these uh, things is to help remind us of the permanence. The reality of uh, our human situation is that uh, we all die, and uh, we have to be realistic about that. And so by having various ritual instruments made of uh, human bone, that uh, teaches us impermanence and uh, always reminds us of impermanence. So that then we can take advantage of uh, the opportunities that we have now while we're alive to see reality. And one of those images of monsters and, and all that kind of devils or right. all the question is with the little dances that are like in the audience and they are maybe inclined out of fear into, into the population. I mean, one kind of right. exception is whether you don't follow our beliefs. This is right. the kind of thing that we Right, no, to. it's not at all like that. Uh, the I question is one about... Kind of exception might be. Right, the question is about, uh, we find uh, images, and, uh, masks, and paintings, and dances, uh, which look to us in the West as if uh, it's involving monsters. And uh, from our perception in the West, it looks as though it's intended to frighten people into uh, following various uh, um, teachings or rules or something like that. But uh, that's not at all its intention, nor is it the way in which it's perceived by uh, the Tibetans uh, or uh, other people themselves. When we have, uh, and, and also this tradition comes from India, it's not uh, uh, invented by the Tibetans. Uh, we uh, work with various images in uh, Tantra, which is one aspect of the Buddhist teachings. And uh, these images are uh, with many arms and legs and heads and uh, look quite fantastic. And uh, they are used for uh, various purposes. One wants to uh, become a Buddha in order to help others the best. And so one wants to uh, have techniques for developing the body and mind of a Buddha. Now, the mind of Buddha is such that uh, it is aware of all things and understands all things at the same time. Particularly, understands people, understands everybody, and how to help everybody. And so, to train ourselves to do this, it's necessary to try to expand our minds, to uh, be aware of more and more things at the same time. So, one of the techniques for doing this is to imagine that we are in the form of uh, one of 
these figures with many arms and legs and faces. The uh, figure itself is uh, symbolic, and all the arms and faces uh, have uh, many different levels of symbolism. If we try to keep 24 insights or facts in our minds simultaneously and do that abstractly, it's very difficult to do. But uh, if, on the other hand, we try to uh, uh, do this by uh, uh, imagining that we have 24 arms, well, that's much easier to do. And these 24 arms are a graphic representation of these insights. And so uh, it's uh, just a technique for opening up the uh, like camera lens in the mind. Now, they are sometimes in uh, very energetic and forceful forms, and these are uh, symbolizing that uh, we have to use a great deal of forceful energy to overcome our laziness and our confusion and our selfishness, and not just treat ourselves like a baby, but uh, come through that uh, very forcefully. So again, that's a level of uh, symbolism. Certainly not <coughs> devil worship, and it's certainly not intended to frighten people. It doesn't frighten people. Well, I was thinking it's like uh, comic books or cartoon figures. Uh, don't frighten people. Teach uh, a lesson. There is, uh, maybe there is a problem of different levels of perception of this kind of things. Because if you can have this kind of deep understanding and kind of complex perception, but it is usually restricted to a very small group that has been within the process of teaching and not uh, better understanding. But for broader uh, circles, it usually are just uh, very, very simplified ethics. And yes, uh, yes. sometimes things get through, through this kind of practice, sometimes uh, certain things can go back and retrograde. Like, uh, I have the knowledge, uh, quite good knowledge of the situation in Buddhism in China, which has been developed for quite a long time and rich abundance of very sophisticated sects. Uh, and later, it became a kind of retro, retro process, which uh, kind of watered it down and the main the main sect that uh, was that more mainly that was the Amida Buddha sect, which was very simplificated just as the of the Buddha's name and a very very kind of simple way to be. And the same thing is uh, this kind of simplification are also the, the this kind of rules uh, in uh, in Tibetan Buddhism. Prairies. Prairies, uh, yes, which simplify the process. You just pull the mirror and the wish right. to show to have a single right. You don't need to worry about anything else. You may set several thousand prayers. This is basically my way. So I, for, for me, it's, it's the, the problem of how how these things uh, work on, on different right. levels. Well, the comment is about uh, the danger of oversimplification of uh, Buddhist practices as uh, time passes. That uh, we find that, uh, uh, as in China, we have uh, the Pure Land sect of Amitabha, and people uh, whose practice has uh, uh, gotten primarily to the simple level of uh, reciting the name of uh, Buddha Amitabha, or in Tibet, people uh, turning prayer wheels. But uh, again, one has to uh, remember that Buddha taught many different techniques for different people, and not everybody is uh, sophisticated. And so uh, it's uh, uh, quite in keeping with uh, Buddha's method to have techniques that can appeal to uh, an unsophisticated audience. But uh, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, there isn't also the sophisticated level of it. Now, uh, with the uh, situation of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, that sophisticated level has certainly uh, continued to uh, exist. It uh, is very much a precedent in itself, but uh, it is uh, continuing and flourishing outside of Tibet with the Tibet refugee community. And uh, the people in Tibet are certainly extremely excited and interested to uh, uh, <coughs> continue this if the opportunity comes. We can see this in the other Tibetan cultural areas of Asia 
like in uh, Mongolia or the uh, um, Buddhist, uh, Tibetan Buddhist uh, cultural regions of the former Soviet Union, uh, Buryatia, Kalmykia, and Tuba, that uh, their traditions were very much oppressed uh, under the totalitarian regimes before, but uh, the people are now uh, very, very excited and uh, very, very uh, uh, motivated to uh, revive their traditions, and not just on a superficial level, but uh, to uh, go deeply into it. So uh, I think this this over. And that's something that I'm about, uh, And Lam Rim. Well, the uh, Lam Rim teachings are uh, teachings on the uh, Lam Rim is a Tibetan word, which means the graded stages of the path. And uh, this uh, teaches the uh, various uh, levels of uh, insight that uh, one needs to uh, develop in order to become a Buddha. And it goes through uh, grades of motivation uh, in order to uh, uh, make spiritual progress. One has to uh, develop one's motivation from uh, just wishing to uh, avoid things getting worse to uh, wanting to uh, get rid of one's problems altogether, and from that to uh, wishing to uh, overcome our problems so we can help others the best. And with that strongest motivation to see reality and so on and help others. Mahamudra, uh, is the, uh, uh, means literally the great seal of uh, reality. And uh, this is a specific type of uh, teachings to uh, help us to uh, see uh, reality specifically in terms of the nature of the mind. And so they fit very harmoniously into the Lamrim tradition. Uh, one develops through the stages of the uh, Lamrim, the gradual process of uh, cultivating our motivation improving our motivation to uh, see uh, to through our problems, see reality, and help others. And then Mahamudra is one particular uh, technique for seeing reality, namely in terms of the nature of the mind. Yes? I guess you said that uh, you is a very uh, critical. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I am critical, I would say that uh, uh, taking drugs is uh, not bad. And uh, how can you uh, how can you know in Buddhism what is good and what is bad? Well, if, uh, the question is, uh, uh, in Buddhism, how do we know what is good or bad, and what is beneficial and uh, harmful? Because we can say, for instance, that uh, taking drugs is uh, beneficial. Well, I think that uh, one has to look in terms of uh, short-term and uh, long-term effects of things that uh, there can be certain things that uh, in the short term are uh, beneficial and helpful. Uh, for instance, uh, if we have a problem, if we get drunk or we uh, um, uh, take heroin, then maybe we uh, forget about our problems and uh, in that sense we feel okay. But uh, when the heroin or the alcohol wears off, then uh, the problem is still there and we haven't really dealt with it. And uh, in fact, uh, we can just make the problem worse. So uh, we have to see the short term and the long term effects. And uh, helpful and uh, harmful is in terms of bringing about um, the welfare for ourselves and uh, others. If uh, by uh, always being uh, drunk or always being uh, intoxicated on some drug, uh, we are uh, neglectful of our children. We are neglectful of our health, we are neglectful of our families, then uh, that's not something terribly beneficial. If uh, temporarily uh, taking some drug gives us certain insights, well, then again, one has to be critical. Are these insights something which are stable, or uh, afterwards, when you look back at them, uh, are they just things that seem terribly profound when we were stoned and uh, when we were not? They seem very silly. So uh, I think that one has to uh, look at it from many different angles. And also one has to see it, uh, you know, Buddhism is not a system of uh, puritanism that says that, you know, well, everybody has to uh, act in this way or that way. What it's saying is that uh, if you look at certain types of behavior, 
Uh, certain things are constructive and other things are destructive. There's no moral judgment in Buddhism. There's no judge saying that, you know, this is good and virtuous, although maybe those are the words that translators will use, and uh, you'll get rewarded for doing this, and this is bad and non-virtuous and a sin, and you go to hell. Again, translators uh, give uh, misleading translations and use that terminology. But uh, if you look at the explanations, it's just saying certain behavior, ways of thinking, ways of communicating are destructive. They're going to cause more problems for yourself and others. It's your choice. You want to continue that, or uh, uh, you want to follow other ways of uh, behavior, which are going to, uh, in the long term, be more beneficial to yourself and others. So it's like that. People have the choice. The basic underlying principle is that everybody wants to be happy, and nobody wants to be unhappy. Uh, the problem is that uh, people often are confused about uh, what will bring them happiness. And uh, maybe they uh, uh, will use some technique that temporarily brings them happiness, but uh, in the long term, doesn't really uh, solve their problem. You know, if I'm very angry, it might bring me happiness to uh, smash my uh, television or uh, smash my car because I'm so angry, but in the long term, you see it as being quite silly. Yes, I have another question. Well, uh, you said that uh, to learn Buddhism is to, uh, to reconcile our problems. And uh, <coughs> now I have a problem. Uh, yes, that's my version. I think now to. to Football, 
politics, uh, religions, making money. They make into an intoxication. It's a matter of the maturity of the people involved. Are they people who uh, just uh, want to stop for themselves and uh, just become dependent on uh, an external system? Or are they people who take responsibility and uh, always uh, use their intelligence to uh, see what is beneficial and harmful? So the, the source of the intoxication is the minds of the people who approach it and not in the actual uh, teaching itself. <coughs> I don't know if you are familiar with the Sanskrit word is called Kreta. It's Kreta. Yes, I'm familiar with it. In the moment, is there any similarity between the situation at this moment now and the greater state of mind? Because the sound came to my mind two times in the third one. What do you mean by the situation now? Well, it's this present moment. I mean, here in the. Pardon? The discussion. In, in the context of our discussion. Yes. Well, a uh, preta is uh, usually translated as hungry ghost from the Chinese translation, which is uh, a mistranslation of the Sanskrit. But uh, the uh, Sanskrit is uh, something like a uh, um, clutching ghost. It's uh, talking about a state of mind uh, in which uh, one is totally um, clutching and uptight, one doesn't want to share with others, one doesn't, uh, one wants to keep everything to oneself and is afraid of opening up and sharing to, uh, with others. And because of that fear of opening up and sharing with others, then uh, everything is closed without uh, this mind and uh, can never get any satisfaction or uh, any uh, benefit from uh, the uh, resources around. Now, certainly there are human states of mind which are uh, reflections of uh, this mentality, although in Buddhism we would say that this is describing a non-human state of mind, but there are traces of it in uh, human minds. And certainly uh, we often experience that because of fear we uh, aren't willing to open up and share. And so uh, uh, we just want to uh, defend ourselves, we're paranoid, and uh, because of this we can't uh, take advantage uh, or enjoy uh, all the wonderful things around us because we're afraid that somebody else is going to take it from us. So that certainly is present in the world. But uh, one must uh, counter this by uh, seeing that uh, we're all equal, that, uh, that everybody wants to be happy, nobody wants to be unhappy, and uh, so uh, we have the same basic uh, drives, same basic wishes, and the same basic rights. And by seeing the equality of ourselves and others, then uh, we can be more open to others and not afraid of sharing. Yes. Um. The investment of those people a lot is a basic part and uh, perhaps the most important statement in the world is that every statement is either right or wrong. Just as in the rest of the world, everything is either good, evil, or good. But um, I heard that uh, once Buddha in the circle of his disciples uh, didn't say anything, he simply showed the door. Uh, he wanted to say that there is nothing to be said. And uh, this lot just, you know, was, this place started um, Zen Buddhism. And Zen Buddhism had started and that uh, he neglected the logic and uh, the difference between right, wrong, or bad and people. Um, well, the uh, question is uh, about uh, in the logic, that in the West we have a form of logic that uh, sees things as uh, either uh, true or false or good or bad, uh, which is uh, really a Western approach to logic. Uh, there are other forms of logic besides that, I should say. And, uh, 
that uh, we also have uh, certain traditions in Buddhism, like uh, Zen, which do not put an emphasis on uh, logic and beyond uh, these uh, categories of good and bad and so on. And uh, how would I comment on that? First of all, uh, in many of the traditions, not Zen, of Buddhism, we uh, do have uh, an emphasis on logic. And uh, logic is uh, based on the idea that uh, things have a cause, have effect, and certain statements follow other statements that are either uh, contradictory or not contradictory. And so uh, there are certain uh, things, like uh, this example of this glass that I was saying, is it true or false that this is a uh, uh, glass of water? It's true. Is it true or false that uh, this uh, could also be a vase for flowers? Well, it's also true. So is this a glass or is this a vase of flowers? We well, can't say for flowers. You can't say that it's one or the other. It depends on its use. And uh, it depends on how somebody uh, conceives of this. So uh, things are not just clearly black and white, but uh, things depend <coughs> on uh, circumstances and situations and conceptualizations. Now that is logical and consistent, but uh, it's not seeing things just in black and white terms. So now when we uh, look at uh, uh, the Zen tradition, which is the Japanese version of the Chinese tradition of Chan, then uh, we uh, see in this uh, tradition uh, statements like, uh, you know, things are neither good nor bad and so on. But uh, again, one has to uh, understand uh, the intention behind that and not take that literally. Uh, when we uh, hear these type of statements, uh, the whole context of uh, Chan Buddhism in China is uh, within the context of Chinese thought. It's taking certain aspects of these teachings which are harmonious with Chinese thinking and then developing it uh, further. So for instance, uh, in uh, Chinese thought, uh, there's this basic idea of the intrinsic goodness of humanity. Uh, which we find in uh, some traditional Chinese philosophers. And so there's this idea that if one can simply quiet down all the various conceptualizing processes and so forth, and come down to the basic nature of uh, humanity, then all the good qualities will uh, shine forth. So then one will naturally do what is beneficial. So it's not denying that uh, certain things are harmful and certain things are helpful. It's a matter of how to train oneself to act in a manner which is beneficial. And so the path to that might not be logic and debate. However, it doesn't deny that uh, things are helpful and other things are harmful. Uh, just on, on, on. You have said there are different of I'm interested in the logic of, can you write on the back of the sample I've been writing with about different logics? Uh, I have heard about paradoxical logic just by the way in one article, but um, right. well, yeah. Yeah, if there's any more about literature on this subject, right. you suggest to me uh, something good. Well, there's something called uh, debate in the Tibetan tradition by uh, Dan Perdue. This type of book. Debate in the Tibetan tradition by Dan Perdue. And uh, in there you'll find good biography of uh, other works as well. But the Tibetan tradition is not paradoxical logic. It's straightforward uh, logic in the system of India. It doesn't mean it's similar to logic that was taught by Aristotle. It's similar, it's slight differences, but uh, I'm not really an expert in that, so I can't tell you the exact uh, difference in an Aristotelian syllogism and an uh, Indian syllogism. And within India, there are different schools of logic, and so the syllogism takes a slightly different form. You have to have an example, for instance, uh, to prove a point in uh, the Western, in the uh, Indian systems. But uh, the, you see, when you say that Western logic 
wants to see things just as uh, black or white, this or that, you know, truth or uh, falsehood. I think that that's an inheritance from biblical thinking and not really intrinsic in uh, the idea of logic as such. Because uh, different things are true in different situations. It's true that you should, uh, I mean, if you say, well, you shouldn't wear so many clothes, well, that's true in summer, it's not true in winter. So there are certain, you know, everything is relative. Well, I can quote, I have read one book from the front, and that one says that uh, John said, said that that which is one is one, but that which is one is also not one. That is not possible in Western world. And then he called paradoxical world. Right, but uh, we're not talking about Zhuangzi and Taoism. No, no, I'm talking about paradoxical law. That means if there is any book you know I have. On um, paradoxical law? Yes. This, uh, this term was used. Uh, I didn't hear anything about that. I'm asking you if you know much more. No, I don't. No, I don't. But uh, statements like that are not so mysterious as they might be seen. Uh, on the surface. Things are one from one certain point of view, another point of view there, there are many. That's other point of view. As I said, it depends on whether one's looking at it simply as a mathematical statement or whether one's uh, trying to apply that to uh, principles in life. Well, you Yes, but this is a mathematical statement. I'm yes, saying it's well, that uh, there are different contexts. Okay, one last question. Uh, the question is, can I say something about Shenrov, the uh, founder of Bonn? Uh, well, there are many uh, different biographies of uh, Shenrov with uh, quite uh, extraordinary deeds and so on, which are uh, ascribed to just as they are to uh, um, Sipama. And uh, it's very difficult to know the uh, historical facts. Uh, according to the basic scheme, uh, he was born in uh, the Persian area of uh, Iranian culture, where that actually was, nobody really knows. And uh, he uh, went to uh, Tibet and uh, taught uh, he also, similar to Abu Zambal and so on, certain things were not uh, really conducive uh, to uh, be understood at that time and uh, didn't reveal everything uh, at the beginning and so on. But as for any further actual facts about uh, Shenrov, that's really very difficult to say because even within the Bon tradition, there are many different versions of his biography. So, which is correct, which is incorrect, which is authentic, inauthentic, again, it depends on uh, what is the intention of the biography. Uh, the biographies are usually uh, in uh, Tibetan, the word for a biography, it means literally um, liberation through aspects. And so one learns about the aspects of an inspiring figure's life. And uh, through that, one may uh, gain inspiration or become liberated from one's own problems. And so uh, biographical literature is written for a specific purpose and not so much concern that on uh, you know, a certain date, uh, this figure did this or that. So I want to uh, thank you all very much. It's been a great